Um, let me introduce our speaker here today, because that's my main reason for, for being up here. Um, I, I wanted to welcome all of you and thank you, but our speaker is the main reason here. Uh, let me also say right off the bat, I have some uh, child uh, commitments this morning that are going to prevent me from listening in, and I am, I am sorry that I'm going to miss this, but I'm going to definitely reconnect with you, Deborah. Deborah Martucci. CIO, Chief Information Officer of Synopsys, is our first keynote here today. She is uh, CIO and Vice President of Information Technology. Synopsys, as most of you know, is located in Mountain View. She has been with Synopsys for over 21 years, delivering world-class, productive, and effective environment which is with respect to base infrastructure, tooling, processes, and also metrics, right? So connecting to a lot of different parts of the organization, obviously. Prior to Synopsys, NASA... She worked for NASA on the Space Shuttle Training Division, or in the Space Shuttle, Shuttle Training Division, and on air, Advanced Aircraft Radar Simulation. Her undergraduate and graduate degrees, uh, master's degree in physics, she brings that to her work. She's been in leadership roles for, for some 30 years now. Uh, please join me in welcoming our first keynote, Deborah Martucci. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I had to check and make sure the mic was working as well as just saying a big, warm good morning to you all. Now, I know there's no coffee allowed, so I will do my best to help add the caffeine effect. I am so honored to have been invited to speak to you all today. And the first comment I'll make is I have no magic. I have no magic to share with you today. But I have a little bit of experience, because after 30 years at my job at Synopsys and NASA and Advanced Radar Systems, I can bring that. And all of you in this room have experience. And the, the magic comes when we can collaborate and share the moments, the feelings of, yeah, I went through that, or yeah, I felt that. So my hope is to just share a little bit of my journey, a little bit of my story. And then I had to take advantage of the one thing I'm passionate about right now, which is the power of information. So I'm going to share a few thoughts around that, and I know some of the workshops and panels are going to touch upon it. So I'll just share with you why I get excited. I hope it's not because I'm a physics student of being a geek or something, but more the power that I have seen come from amazing information. So let me just start with a few messages I hope to share. Really, the word mentoring can't be used enough. And it's getting new, different adjectives, different words around it. Collaboration, partnership, sharing, supporting each other. But I will tell you a few stories about mentoring that have helped or impacted or affected me. And I hope it will allow you to think about those in your life that you can call back to to say they made a difference and understand you can make those differences also in the future. Also, uh, this ladder of business intelligence. Again, I won't go through all of the slides on the financial uh, evaluations. I'll just kind of tell you what I think is like the cool, sexy part of it. And hopefully you'll be able to see why I get um, really happy about, about what it does for us. And then creating choices, which is like designing your future. So I'll share a little bit around that and help you as you see um, where I've come from and what I'm doing. So life is a journey. You've heard that probably many times. Life is a journey. Life is full of chances, opportunities, challenges, scary things. But you know, life brings you through things like going to college and making friends, right? That's important when you're on that part of your journey. Getting uh, that chance to go on an airplane and fly somewhere you've never been, maybe by yourself, being scared, not sure what that's going to mean. Getting so overwhelmed when you finally get that job and realize that what a big part of it is is not the fun stuff. And then ending, as a person like myself, after 21 and a half years at my current job or company at Synopsys, I'm now looking at what my next opportunities and options are going to be. So the journey doesn't end until the very, very end. And so you have to be ready for all of that. So I'm going to share a few easy points. I won't go through all the details, but uh, you'll see that I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Hence, my accent might sneak out a little. And, um, and I tend to talk very quickly, so I'll do my best to pace it appropriately. But in Boston, I was one of nine kids. I was the oldest girl, so I guess I used to think that gave me something special. 
Um, I was fortunate to have two educated parents back in the old days when it wasn't as common. And I would tell you that thanks to my parents, I used to mow the lawn as many times as I had to dust the dining room, as did my brothers. And when you got in trouble, you had to do dishes no matter what your gender. And so we always encouraged the other siblings to get in trouble because it meant you got off on dish duty. <laughs> but my real story in this part of my growing up was being in high school. You know, I was a cheerleader. And in high school, being a cheerleader, it was way more important that you had friends and that you were dating the captain of the football team. But I had to be different, so I dated the captain of the football team of the rival team, just to mix it up. <laughs> But my first real mentor, besides my parents, who played a huge role, was this man called Russ Rayner. He was a physics teacher in high school. And I'm not sure what he saw, but I'm glad I took the opportunity that when he saw something in me, he plucked me out of that cheering squad. He said, you need to take chemistry and physics. None of the other cheerleaders were taking chemistry and physics. I didn't even know exactly what that was. But suddenly, I found myself getting mentored by a, a teacher who would insist that I stayed and did the lab work, that I did my homework. He, it was so rough on me, I thought, at that time. But thank goodness that I had that impact in my life. Because it drove me to take a degree in physics from North Adams State College in Massachusetts. And then when you're done with a bachelor's in physics, what do you do? You go to graduate school. <clears throat> so, I got on an airplane by myself with two suitcases, and I flew to Houston, Texas as a Boston girl. And I found, again, a series of opportunities and mentors and people that impacted my life there. So here I was in Houston. It's really, really hot in Houston. Um, people talk way different than me. I remember the first day someone called me a damn Yankee. You know what I said? I said, I'm a Red Sox fan. <laughs> Okay, I was a little naive. I did not know a lot of things. <laughs> but I, as I was going through graduate school, one of the mentors, as I mentioned, my mom, who just passed away three years ago, and I miss her every day, but my mom was there so that I could call her while I was starting the graduate program and say, Mom, what was I thinking? This is way too hard. I don't know what I'm doing. And she would say, Deborah, it's okay. You can fly back home, but not until next Friday. We'll buy you a ticket. You can come home next Friday. Well, that week I met my first friend. And then I realized, I'm okay. I've got a friend. Maybe I'll try it another few weeks. So again, that impact was very important. But also important was one of our deans, Dean Walker, from the Natural Science and Mathematics Department. Again, I was fortunate that he must have seen a little something. And when I was struggling with quantum physics, we would all struggle with quantum physics, don't you think? I was struggling with quantum physics. He, again, he took me under his wing. He showed me some of the magic around some of the math that I was maybe missing out on. And suddenly I went from not even thinking I was going to pass to getting an A in quantum physics. So he made a huge impact for me. And then my first job, you know, we all probably remember your first job, right? My real first job was up in Boston. I worked at dry cleaners. But my second real big job was getting a chance to work at NASA. And being able to be on the training program for the shuttle astronaut team, having trained many, many of them, and realizing that I saw my first woman in leadership role, Nora Williams. She was a director inside the NASA program. Again, it was the first time I had a role model to watch on the pros and the cons. I mean, I watched some of the stuff she went through that didn't seem fair, it didn't seem right. But I also saw her using her intuition and her skills as a woman to make ama amazing change, particularly in managing all of our teams. So I had a great chance to really learn from Nora what it meant. So as you go from graduate school and you get your first job, somewhere in there was a marriage, right? I found this guy. He was actually in the physics program. And our joke was, he was lucky to get me, right? Because there were lots of other men. And he kind of jokes us, yeah, but you were the only choice because I was the only woman in the room. <laughs> Luckily, I've been married to him for 31 years, and so far, he's still alive. No. <laughs> but again, I would only share one point here about NASA, which I think taught me my first lesson of being in a very male-dominated environment. NASA is still, but was back then, such a male-dominated environment that the first big thing, big presentation I had to give 
was in a room similar to this, and there's a man named Gene Krantz. You may know that name from your history books. Gene Krantz was the guy with the crew cut and the mission control that used to bark at everybody and was an amazing, amazing, uh, brilliant man. He was in the room. I was doing a presentation to try to teach the group of people, to, not to teach them, to explain to them that there was an error in the real-world flight software that could cause a disastrous problem on the shuttle if it's not corrected. It was a real-world flight software problem. We knew that because we had been running simulation software, which I was in charge of, and training programs, and we kept saying, no, all of our training stuff is right. There's something wrong with that flight software that we're loading into the real computers. Imagine, I was kind of cute back then. I was maybe 24, 25. I'm standing in a room, and I, got, I thought I had a pretty new dress, and I'm standing there ready to do this presentation, and there's a guy in the room, in the front row, and he's whispering to his friend. He's going, oh, she's kind of cute. Gee, I wonder where she's from. Remember, I'm in Texas, right? And again, you know, you take risks in your life. I took the risks to stop my presentation because I was not focusing on anything I was saying. I was getting disturbed by this chatter. So I stopped the whole room and I walked right over to the man in the row and I said, I'm from Boston. My dress is from Nordstrom's. And if you have any other questions for me as a woman, you can wait until I'm done with the presentation. <laughs> It was a risk, right? It was a risk. But I was so kind of angry and thought, i gotta, I got to take an action here. Well, later in that day after the presentation was done and IBM, which was the company that did the flight software, recognized and accepted that they had an error. Gene Krantz, that same very man, was standing outside the building as I was leaving and he pulled me aside and he said, good stuff, Deborah." Because he thought that that was exactly what was needed and it was probably going to be needed a little bit more at NASA to start to encourage women and to help them as they stepped into this male-dominated world. I tell that story because you're going to find that the industry I've been in now for 21 and a half years is also quite male-dominated. It's called the semiconductor field. <clears throat> so I'll get to that in a moment. But as I show you, I love my little graphics, but you know, again, got on that airplane in Houston. Why did I come to California? Well, you know, they talk about options and choices. So let me tell you, in Texas, I had gotten married, as I mentioned, and this husband of mine came to me and said, I have a job interview in California. And I said, okay, bye-bye, I'm busy. I went to my work. He came back, he goes, it went really well. They want me back for another interview. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> then he says, I have a job offer, Deborah. We, you know, we're going to move to California. Wow. I have a career, I have a job, I have friends, I have a house, I have a gym that I love going to, I have two dogs. What do you mean? So I actually remember saying to him, isn't divorce an option? <laughs> Life is about options and choices. Well, needless to say, I went with the other opportunity, which was, okay, maybe I can go to California and I can find my new uh, set of cha uh, challenges and opportunities. In Mountain View, California, as you know, Silicon Valley, what an amazing opportunity in life right now to be a part of that. I can only share with you, every day is an adventure. Every day is excitement. Every day is a challenge. And every day I use my physics training. And you want to know why? Physics training to me is learning to solve problems. It doesn't matter sometimes. Many times it's people problems. I always wonder, geez, did I miss a class in physics while I'm dealing with this amazing people problem in my organization? But it's all about solving problems. So luckily in California, I've had that opportunity. As I was mentioned by Rich, the, um, my next job after NASA was radar systems, or advanced radar systems. Don't be that impressed with the advanced word. But advanced radar systems were, of course, very important for things like the B-2 bomber and a lot of weaponry, a lot of government stuff. So later you might ask yourself, wow, when the government funding was being cut for programs on training systems, bombing systems, that was a, maybe that was a good opportunity. I didn't see it at the time because when that happened, they shut down the facility that I was working at. I was unemployed for the first time in my life. And I'll be honest with you all, I was scared to death. What if I can't get a job? It doesn't matter that I have a degree in physics. It doesn't matter I worked at NASA. It doesn't matter. What if I can't get a job? So all of those vulnerabilities and insecurities, don't ever think you're the only one suffering them in your heart, okay? Because we all do. We all do. And then synopsis, what I'm going to tell you is this. The best company in the world ever. I've been there 21 and a half years. It's an amazing company. It's got great values. I've been given opportunity to grow forever. Um, but it's in... 
the semiconductor arena of, of the world. So again, very male dominated. I've been working my way up the ladder, okay? I didn't get any, um, I didn't just, just get given any blessings or anything. I worked my way up. So there were times when I wasn't sure this was the right thing to do, but al always we have that scare, right? I remember my first big promotion to a director level. It was gonna come with a smaller group and a brand new vice president to report to. And I thought, ooh, I wouldn't have want, I want it to be familiar and slower growth maybe. And what's with the less people? I thought when you get promoted, you had more people. Isn't it all about how many people you have on your team? Again, a huge learning for me to be, to be again, provided the opportunity by a mentor named Jim McInerney, who was able to say to me, Deborah, the value that you are going to have for the company, the impact you will have for this company is so much more significant in this new role of director of software engineering. It's not about how many people are reporting to you. So a big lesson for me at that time. Today I have 340 people reporting to me, and believe me, I take the nine from the old days many, many times. I'm going to ask you to take one small positive reflection moment. If you've got a pen, you can jot it down if it helps you. I just wanted to have you take a moment to think about what mentors have helped you in your own life. Because if you don't get asked to come to Berkeley and speak in a group like this, and therefore you have to do your homework and think it all through, sometimes you're going so fast you don't stop and think. What about the role your parents played? What about different teachers? What about friends? What about coworkers, bosses, other leaders in your organization or in your world? The reason I want you to take a minute to think about it is I want all of you to become that for others. So mentoring is a two-way street. So just take a minute, and I'm watching the clock carefully, so um, it's going to be less than a minute. And it gives me a chance to breathe. Okay, you got your answers? I'm not going to call on you, but I want you to keep that in your, in your, um, in your list. So, Let's jump for a new subject for a minute. Information I want to share with you, my, my passion around information. So I love this graphic, by the way. So what's expected of today's executives in this crazy world, not just Silicon Valley, anywhere? What is expected of those executives? Now what I wrote here was try changing the oil while the car is moving, okay? Because what happens? Usually the car gets, goes away and you're left with the oil. The reason I say that is, this day and age, especially with technology, you don't get the option anymore to say, okay, I'm going to make a change. Stop everything you're doing. I'm going to make the change, and then you can restart what you were doing. You can't do that to people, organizations, companies. So you have to start, as an executive especially, getting, getting your hands around this problem. Now, I would say to you this. The, re the reason data and information is important is you all look at a dollar bill. What does it say? It says, in God we trust. My theme, and I stole it from others, is in God we trust. Everyone else bring me data. Because it's the data, the information, the knowledge that is going to be driving the decisions you're going to make as an executive, as a manager, as a leader. And even in doing your own individual job, I would say to you, in, information is going to become a very key role for you. So don't get scared. I'm not going to t test you on these graphs. I would say to you, these are four out of a many, many big group of metrics that I have to use every day. Okay, so my job is CIO. H how many of you know what a CIO is? Yes, it means career is over. <laughs> okay, no, not for me, but for many. Because you know, being the IT queen means you're responsible for everything from the phones and the network working to the applications that the sales guys are using. So why can't I have a Mac when I want one if you want me to have a PC? IT has an amazing opportunity to drive a company forward. And I manage a, a budget right now of about $120 million a year. That's what I manage. So if the company is going to put that much responsibility on me, and I'm not a finance guy, I'm an IT physics person, I better have done my homework and understand how to manage finances. So I spent many years managing this group, keeping track of data, but not always having my hands wrapped around the meaning of the data, the information that the data is trying to scream at you, the knowledge that the information is trying to say to you. So what I would tell you is, aside from all these slides, which makes it, if, you, if you're a CIO, you'd go, wow, she does a good job at her job. I just want you to know that. <laughs> but what I would share with you is, imagine here, 
You've got this OPEX budget. You've got 120-ish million when you add those two lines up. I just want to tell you a secret. One day, about th two years ago now, three, I'm in my office with my staff leads and my finance analysts, and I'm saying, guys, I got to be, be able to understand why my budget goes up every year. Because all the GMs in my company know is Deborah's budget gets bigger every year. And when we need to cut back expenses, we need to go after the girl that has the most money, right? So I had to really do drill down, drill down, drill down. And one day, we sat there together and we realized if you put the money into two buckets, an orange bucket and a purple bucket, all of a sudden something was screaming out at us, right? Something was screaming out that if the two numbers add up to your total budget and one of them has been sort of flat and the other is growing, then if you can figure out what contributes to that growing graph, I can tell a good story without a lot of boring math behind it, right? And lo and behold, since Synopsys is an engineering company, that orange line item all contrib was contributed to by the investment of the engineering environment, buying more cores of computers, more petabytes of storage, more licenses for optimized software development, more quality improvements. On and on went the list. And all of a sudden, imagine the power of that information. When I could look at a GM in the eye and say, oh, you think my budget's too big. Shall I stop buying computers for the group? Because I don't want to do that. Well, Deborah, why can't you cut the other stuff, the, the, you know, the housekeeping stuff of IT? Well, because, you know, I've kept that flat for the last 14 years, and you've tripled the employee base of our company. So see that difference of having a conversation at a business level because your data is rock solid and you've analyzed it. That's the reason why I get so passionate around data. One last slide here. And again, if I tested you on gigahertz per engineer, I'm sure you'll all get an A. But what I would say to you is, again, imagine you're collecting data, you're looking at the data, you're trying to manage a team with this data. But if you don't take that time to analyze it, to think about it, you're not going to be able to look and go, wow, no matter what all that data is trying to say to us, that 17% utilization is screaming something, and it isn't good. If you're only using 17% of the resources I gave you, and you come and ask me to buy you more, I'm going to have to say, but you're only using 17%. That's the conversation I can now have with the GMs, who are the leaders of all these different groups. Not that they're bad people. It's because if they don't have the data, but their guys are complaining because they're not using the stuff we give them. So you can see that mass quantities of data by itself is meaningless. And I'm a real kind of proponent right now that everybody wants to talk about big data. Big data, big data. Oh, my God, big data. It's everywhere. <laughs> and I want to say yes, but it only makes the problem worse. It only means you better have your analytics style and skills together because there's that much more information you have to comb through and kind of tease out that knowledge that it's trying to scream at you. Okay, so commercial over. I just really feel passionate about that. And again, I'll take uh, uh, 30 seconds for you to just think about in your life, in your job, in your career aspirations, is information going to play a role? And if so, maybe what kind? Um, what kind will drive your decisions? And I can tell you that my husband would say, he uses the information of the extra spending money he gets to have because he loves to buy toys. And now we have a country house where you imagine the toys can be tractors and, and stuff for gardening. and So that's his information, right? Mine is, do I get to go to Lululemon and buy a few more outfits for working out? <laughs> Example, though, information is going to be driving everything. And in your jobs and in your life and your career, it will. And I'll share one more moment, as I mentioned, in my life, my journey's not over. So you can imagine there's a lot of information you have to analyze if you want to think about a retirement program or at least a slowing down, which I love that phrase. Maybe I better slow down. Um, but again, in life, information is going to be very, very powerful. So I'll ask you to just keep that in mind. So in this space of designing your future, here's what I just want to share some thoughts around it is a choice designing with opportunities it's all about recognizing and taking advantage of that opportunity, that choice. 
often don't try to assume that you've got to have the whole five-year plan or else I'm not going to go with that opportunity. Because so many times that opportunity is what makes you take that corner and then a whole new set of op options and choices show up. So don't assume you have to know all the answers. But understand that if something is put in front of you and you have a choice, like when that physics t uh, high school teacher gave me that choice, I'm thankful that I recognized. I didn't know exactly what it was going to mean, but I recognize it. And physics now, as you see my little, these are my little teasers here, physics has really been the thing I've gone back to. It, it's what, that opportunity has opened doors. Even though some of those doors were once at a party and a really cute guy, I was single, a really cute guy comes over and he's talking to me and what do you do? And, oh, I play racquetball, I do gymnastics, I used to be a cheerleader. Oh, but what are you taking in school? Oh, I'm in a master's program for physics. And he turned around and walked away. <laughs> so the opportunity there was, he was obviously not good enough for me. <laughs> but again, the opportunities, choices, just realize that they're going to be out there and you've got to be ready and willing to say, I'm, I'm going to try that out. I'm going to see what that does. So for my next uh, opportunity, again, I'm looking at different options. And it's scary. And, you know, you, I want my security, a member of the small, the group that I used to manage, and then they want me to be a director. They want me to change everything. Now I have to look at that as we all do through the journey of life. So keeping that in mind, some, some final thoughts for each of us is if you don't design your future, someone will. And you probably won't like the results of that as much as if you're driving your own bus. You're controlling where you're going. And you're creating those options and opportunities so that you can make a choice. Remember, an opportunity is put in front of you so you can take advantage of it, so you have a choice to make. A or B, yes or no, do it or not. But if you don't take the advantage of that opportunity, what's your choice? You know, door number three, you don't get to choose. So I would just say remember that. Constantly explore career ideas. Even if you think you know exactly where you're going, be flexible around how you might get there and be flexible around what else it could end up being. Who knew that physics would end up making me a CIO? I didn't know what a CIO was when I was going to school in physics. Again, except for either career is over, or as I like to say in my company, it could mean cute information officer, couldn't it? And they just put up with me. So explore those ideas, right? Collaborate, as I mentioned, mentoring, partnering, communication, friendship. Collaborate on every level, up, down, and sideways, because none of us are in this on our own. So collaboration is really important. And as I mentioned about taking advantage of mentoring, it's a give and take each time you do it. I've had the joy of learning so much when I've been asked to be a mentor of women at my company, Cleo, Bashad. There's a lot of ladies that come and ask me to partner with them, help them, coach them. But I learn so much as well when I'm in that relationship with them. And some of the boys come. The guys come. I have a guy, Tommy, that works for me in the security team. He's asked if I would be his mentor. And I thought... It's so enlightening. Yes, absolutely. And I've already been helping him get some career advice, coaching. No, don't go and scream that you're qualified to take that manager job yet. Right? Let's take some classes. Let's, let's uh, take it uh, in the path that makes sense. And as I mentioned, don't limit your choices. Do as many things as you can. Open as many doors as you can so that the actual choice that you make is based on what is in your heart and your soul and your desire and not what someone told you you should do. So designing your future, first of all, the fact that you're here, huge, right? It already says you're thinking about it, you're conscious about it, and you know how important the networking is going to be, as was mentioned earlier uh, with Lauren. You've got to be ready to, to expose yourself, talk to each other, be vulnerable, share what scares you. Find out that you know, you're not the only one with that feeling, and all of a sudden you'll soar. I promise you that. So then just, um, I want to mention again, a lot of the panels and workshops, I'm so excited to see the subject matter, really is clearly aligned with what I see every day in the Silicon Valley in a high-tech company. So I wanted to just assure you that what you're going to be exposed to and sharing today is real. It's every day out there in this world of leadership. And so creating your own roadmap and strategy is really, really key. You've got to do it. Being here is the first start. So your takeaways, as I mentioned about mentoring is so, so important, the power of information and creating those choices that you want to make. If you choose to do the homework, I know that's not always said here at Berkeley, but if you choose to do the homework, 
Think about learning something new every day and recognizing that that was something new that you learned that day. At my job, I tease sometimes, like, oh, I learned something new. Can I go home now? And they kind of laugh. But learn something new because life is a journey of learning every day. Also, either be a mentor or go find one or go share one with, with another coworker. Say, let, let, let's just meet for lunch once a month. Let's talk about our challenges, our, our, our issues. And then I just wanted to say some references which are really there to help uh, enable you to move forward. There's a great book called The Power of Mentoring. I say it's a great book because I'm referenced in it. No, I'm kidding. I am referenced in it. But I had the joy of being a mentor to a woman at Cisco who was uh, part of the staff to John Chambers that used to help him write his speeches and do his PR. Again, I used to feel so humble. What could I possibly help her with? And yet, indeed, we shared our experiences, our challenges, and we both grew so much from that experience that we've had. The Ladder of Business Intelligence is a book by Jim Cates. It's an amazing uh, scientific methodology on taking massive quantities of information and going up the ladder to make it true information and knowledge, which drives business and, and intelligence. So if you're interested in that area, there's a reference for you. And then the, I just put here one of the many, many leadership programs that are out there, because I want you to promote your company. If you're working at a, at a job, I want you to promote yourself to go and look at what that investment might be. And if you're a manager, promote it for your teams. Because this continuous learning is very, very key. And none of us, again, can do it on our own. So with that, I want to say, life is about choices. And who doesn't love kittens? <laughs> life is about choices. And there's different ways to take that same road. And it's up to you to decide, am I going to go the hard way, or am I going to get some help? But choices is what you will deal with every day. And if you look at those opportunities and you try to recognize and take advantage of what, when they're there for you or you create them, I can only say if you use that power wisely, you will enjoy your life and you'll get the things you need. With that, I want to say have an absolutely fabulous day. And I want to thank you for uh, having me here today. And I'm open for the questions at this point. But thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Deborah. I'm Christina. Hi, Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Um, you kind of alluded to this, I think, in a book that you recommended. But what do you think the most important factors are to consider when mentoring or managing someone else? Mentoring or managing someone else? Well, I think the first thing is, again, as I mentioned, recognizing it's a two-way street and understanding that there'll be, there'll be strengths gained from both sides and being open. You know, being true to yourself, being open. I, I hear it, I see it sometimes done up in articles, but it's truly the thing you have to say to yourself every morning when you wake up and you look in that mirror and you say, I've got to be true to myself. If I'm going to go on a journey for a career, it's got to be my passion. It's got to be what's going to make me want to go there every day. Otherwise, it's a job. And I use that phrase very carefully. There's a real big difference between just having a job and building and driving your career and enjoying a career. So I think the most important thing is being open and honest. And, um, and again, knowing that you, whatever role you're in, you're going to get value on both ends. Yeah, thank you. All right, we've got an audience question. Okay. So um, Deborah, we're curious, who are some women leaders that you look up to? Hmm. Well, within Synopsys, we're fortunate to have two executive women that I am strongly partnered with and I look up to. Uh, a lot because I know that they're in the same semiconductor crazy world that I'm in and that there aren't that many of us. I'd say other women, though, certainly uh, in the state of California, we have some amazing um, representative, representatives that I look up to. Uh, again, I, I would bet if they do the metrics that the, the percentage of women in the Senate and, and House are probably similar to a lot of our um, industries, which is pretty low. Um, I always say, though, I applaud the women that are making strides and making impacts and changes in this world uh, because, like it was said earlier, it paves the way for the next generation. And I'm confident that no, no one at a young 24 to 26-year-old age standing in front of a group of men like I did at NASA will hopefully have to cope with some of what I coped with. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that that's going to be the change. And those changes are being made by the strong women that we have today in the world. 
We have another audience question for you. What do you see as the key advantages of longevity? So you've been at Synopsys for 21 years at the same company. That's a great question. What I would tell you is, I use a phrase, I made choices that had an impact and I had to live them. Some people say you made the bed, you have to lay in it, but that's not quite as eloquent. But the idea is, is I believe what longevity brings to some people for some companies is I can make new mistakes. I can make new ideas happen. But when someone says, well, let's just rip out the SAP system and put in Oracle because I'm the new CIO and I want to affect change, we can stop that sort of madness in a company. So longevity to me means you, you're staying with the decisions you've made, you're living them, and you're getting, of course, the joy often that I've had of knowing that you know, the same little software script that I wrote 20 years ago when I first joined Synopsys was the foundation of what is now a revenue generating product. So again, that longevity, I think, allows you to grow in your job and for your job and your company. Because as I've said often to people when I look at a resume and say, you know what it looks like? It looks like you've had one year experience 10 times. And that is very different than a 10-year experience in a career. So th those are some of the points I would make about longevity. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions focusing around mentoring, so both being, finding a mentee and mm. being a mentor. So in your personal experience, what is the best advice a mentor has ever given you? I would say the best advice a mentor ever gave me was a vice president named Jim who sat next to me in the office. And he came in my office one day. He was my boss and my mentor. And he said, Deborah, you need to find a different way to make decisions than whoever's standing at your door yelling at you the loudest. And it was an, um, one of those, again, early moments around data and power of information, which caused me to do my first deep analytical dive into data analysis. And I probably could have written a paper, I think, on it, but I didn't. I just did it for synopsis and moved on. But the idea was taking the people yelling about equipment needs and creating basically the data that, would, that, would, that I shared a little bit up there with you. Only back then it was about lost engineering hours. It was the idea of taking all the data around outages. If you're in charge of IT, right, you're in charge of outages. You're never in charge of how long the network stays up. You're only in charge of how long it was down. <laughs> and taking all that data and collating it and doing what he taught me was the Pareto analysis that many of you brilliant people in this room know, do, lining it up to say, what's the biggest contributor to this pain? And how can we wipe that out? So I would say that that was a huge impact to me as a boss and mentor that I saw with clear results. And he stayed with me because people still yelled at me for a while at my doorway. So it was really a, a key one for me. Great. Um, so this is probably going to be, unfortunately, our last question. But judging by all these questions, we loved the story about you speaking up to those men at NASA. <laughs> um, so we're wondering, have you ever had a time where speaking up like that or being outspoken has backfired? I would say no. I would say no. That, that the, the only thing I've ever seen it do is either do some self-correction of, of the bad behavior um, or uh, create a little bit of humility and maybe embarrassment, which sometimes is good. Sometimes embarrassment can be a learning tool for, for some of these people. Um, but I would also say to you that, that, that it, it can go both ways. I've also taken moments to pull aside a woman who maybe in a meeting is behaving in a way that is not constructive, effective, important, impactful. And that, so, it, so it's both ways, right? That, um, that you need to be open to creating this nat natural, neutral world where it doesn't matter what you're wearing or who you, you know, what, what your gender is, that it, it starts to not matter. That your voice and your opinions and your knowledge are what matter in that room. And that's the goal I would have. OK? Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. Thank you.